my name is Pinky Gilani. You are watching What Women Want on Pinky TV. And these conversations are brought to you by SBM Bank. If you're on Facebook, make sure you leave a comment. Let us know where you're watching from. Also, tag a friend to watch this show. If you are on YouTube, subscribe to this channel so you can be amongst the first to be catching episodes like this. Today is an exciting day because I'm speaking to a mentor, a former boss, a friend, a colleague. Oh my gosh, she's so much, she's so much in my life and more. Carol Mandy, hi. Hi, hi, thank you. Hi. So you know, Carol, on, on this show, we teach our audiences to unlearn mm. things that they're very much used to. So one thing that we were saying, we were just talking about it, is that we always introduce other people yes. and not so much ourselves. So we want you to teach our audiences how to unlearn that by introducing yourself. Wow, that's so interesting. <laughs> thank you, Pinky. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, my name is Carol Mandy. I, um, how do I introduce myself? I'm a media professional. I've been in the media space for over 20 years, probably going to 25 years now, primarily in uh, print, doing a lot of work um, in magazines. Um, and you know the magazines I've worked with, which is True Love Magazine, Drum, which you edited at some point, Home and Living, I believe you also edited at some point. Um, so my, I've worked a lot in magazine publishing in, in print. Um, I've hosted TV shows. I hosted Sabuleni TV show. And all of that is really about uh, my passion for telling stories that transform lives. So at the heart of it, I'm a storyteller, which is really now we're coming to the essence. I'm a storyteller, just telling stories on different platforms and stories that impact, inspire, and transform lives. Yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, you know, we were just talking to somebody earlier who walked in here, mm -hmm. um, and she's, she's a politician, but she was like, yes, I know Carol Mundy from such a long time ago. How does it make you feel when you see people who are big achievers today who say to you that we have learned from you? It makes me humbled actually it makes me feel very humbled because um, she also said that you, you're just doing what you're doing and you have no idea where, um, what people are drawing from it and people will draw what they need to draw from it at whatever time they need to draw, whatever lesson they want to draw. But for me, I'm just there doing what I feel I've been called to do. Um, and it's interesting because I've written a column for also about 20 years. Um, and every time before I write that column, I pray. And I say, okay, God, what do you want to say? Wow. You get what I'm saying? Yes. So when people say that, then I know that it's, and then I sit and I do my thing. Mm -hmm. But I know that ultimately I'm just a vessel, you know, um, one of the many millions of vessels that are in the world. So for me, it humbles me um, and it makes me grateful for the opportunity. Wow. I, you know, as you're answering this, I'm like <coughs> questioning myself. Pinky, how come you're not more intimidated by <laughs> speaking to a former boss? I remember our days when, mm. when you interviewed me, how you guided me, how you mentored me. Um, you've been in the business for a very long time, Carol. And your, um, your, you, mu you must have seen how women have evolved. Yes. Let's talk about the media industry because that's the industry we are in. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also, you know, sort of rub shoulders with very many powerful women in the country. Um, can we talk about a time where it was a struggle? It still probably is a struggle mm -hmm. for, for the woman to break the glass ceiling. But I think we've come, we've moved, yeah? Um, but let's talk about that time when it was a struggle and what we had to do in order to overcome this. Mm -hmm. I think there was, um, just speaking about one thing, if I just pick one thing, I remember when I had my first child or um, I was a brand new mother working in media. And media, as you know, in Kenya and worldwide is male dominated. Um, and I'm a brand new mother and you've got to keep your deadlines. And so we don't have weekends on media. You know, you work when you need to work. And raising a young family at a very difficult time and having some of the issues that you have as a mother, say, for instance, you don't have nanny, you don't have a help. Mm -hmm. And going to my boss and saying to him, I need to take the day off or I need to take a couple of days leave because I don't have a nanny at this point and I don't have anyone to leave my kids with. 
And he said to me, I mean, what do you do to these people? Why do they keep, you know, leaving? leaving? <laughs> and I'm like, oh my goodness. I mean, it, it was the first time I was asking, but immediately it became, he picked it up from the stereotype that when you hire a woman who has children, be ready you know, for yeah. her not to show up to work fully and all of that. That was over 20 years ago. And that was the stereotype that was there. And I was taken back because I was very young. I was like 26, 27. And I was like, this is the first time I'm actually asking for time. And I'm actually taking leave. But c coming face to face with the stereotype that makes it difficult for mothers, for women who are mothers of young children to still um, pursue a career and to pursue professional success while at the same time trying to be a very successful parent or a present parent to their to their to their families and not feeling like they have to give up one for the other right so i think those are just some of the challenges that you know were there there are less of those right now because what we've seen over the years is big organizations begin to embrace the fact that um, we need to create uh, policies that are friendly for women who are either nursing, so we allow our mothers to come to yeah. work with their babies, um, or we provide crashes for them. So we've seen a lot, a lot of you know leaps yes. and bounds as far as that is concerned. So there's been a lot of progress, I think, but those are just some of the challenges that you know any woman who wants to succeed in her career or in her business will come face to face, maybe less than we did, but at some point she will she will face those kind of challenges. Challenge. And then uh, also in previous <coughs> times, and I don't know if it's still prevalent now, although mm -hmm. I do feel that there is a, there is a change. Mm -hmm. Women were often pitted against one another. Um, and I remember you as my boss, you always encouraged, you always, you know, motivated. Was this through any experience of your own where you felt you weren't supported as a woman by a woman boss? or where you felt you were put up against another woman just because you're maybe in the same field or industry that there was a comparison. Mm -hmm. How did you um, become this person? Wow, answer. thank you. Thank <laughs> you for that. Um, I think when I look back, uh, w what I want to say is there are good women bosses or female bosses just as much as there are good male boss bosses. And then there are those that are unhelpful, whether they're male or female. So you find them across the gender. Um, so I've been fortunate to have some really good bosses. I've also been fortunate to come across, you know, bosses from hell. And um, I remember one particular boss again when I was having my baby. Um, I was pregnant and I had such severe morning sickness and she just made my life difficult. I couldn't even go to buy sweets because you know how you just have this horrible taste mm -hmm. in your mouth. And she really made my life very difficult during that season of my life. And I made um, a pact with myself that I will, when I come across a woman, and especially a woman who's either pregnant or she's a mother, I will empathize yeah. as opposed to because I mean I couldn't I couldn't get it I was like but she's been a mother she's been you know <laughs> like been in this situation. She's been, yeah, and this was my first baby and and I'm having morning sickness and fatigue and all manner yeah. of issues and I can't even go out to the supermarket to buy sweets to you know yeah. it was just so many small things you know um, but it was it was a season, and it came and it passed. And what I chose to look to take from that from that was I didn't know I was ever going to be a boss. I was just like my first job, right? Yes, yeah. Um, but I figured out that if I'm ever in a situation like that, then help the other help another woman, you know, because you've been there, yeah. you know what it's like. Um, I've um, had situations where I've worked with women who are going through difficult. Um, difficulties in their marriages and one of the things that I realized is that that woman is unable to perform <laughs> she's unable to perform to the same degree whereas you know possibly if a man is having the same marital issues yeah. would still show up because men have a way of compartmentalizing yes. things so they go to work and they say this is why okay I left I home to, I need to yeah yeah. at home <laughs> the woman goes to work with the whole thing of oh my goodness there's so much stuff going on i don't know if i'm gonna make it and she brings that aura into into the office not because she's 
bad and she should change. But because she's a woman, she's wired that way. She's wired to experience those emotions because that's what makes her nurture, not just her children, but also other women and you know people around her. So she comes in and much as you try in the corporate space to keep your private life private, um, you, your emotions are part of your day. Yeah. as you're trying to work. And so when we're in those sorts of situations, just also bearing in mind and learning that women respond to those kind of difficulties very differently. And how do you support those um, women who are in that kind of a situation as opposed to saying, okay, you're not meeting your targets. A man doesn't have to carry a pregnancy and work. Mm. And in the same way, a man may not carry his emotions to work when things at home are challenging. Um, so women are very special in that way and they need to be supported. So, um, and, I, and I've seen over the years, there are a lot of policies, a lot of companies putting policies in place, providing support, providing therapy, counseling services to their staff, just because they recognize that women, you know, because women are uniquely create or crafted um, use the, you know tap into that uniqueness yeah. and don't punish her for that uniqueness and support her through it because she could otherwise be a great worker just going through a particular season that's amazing do you feel that as as the editor and the publisher of true love magazine for the last 10 years which is a magazine that has impacted um, not only women because I remember when we did the breast cancer awareness mm. issue we there's a lot of men who came forward and spoke about it as well. Um, so who have, uh, you know, people who have read this magazine, do you feel that you have been part of this change via True Love? Um, I know that we've done a lot of, we've, we've had an impact um, on various um, uh, spheres, I would say. Um, definitely, I know, and we set out to do that when we, we began publishing the magazine. Uh, we set out to um, support the fashion industry. We set up to, and we did that. Um, we set up to advocate, you know, to advocate for women's health and for um, looking at issues of women's health, not as taboo, uh, whether it's breast cancer or cervical cancer, whatever it is, yeah. um, taking the taboo away from it. And I believe, you know, when you talk about that, that particular issue, and that was one of my favorite magazines, yeah. because you guys post, posed <laughs> <laughs> topless, right? You just covered your breasts, I think, yeah, right? Yeah. And you were on the cover of that as yeah, well, of that yeah. magazine. And the reason why we did that was because we wanted to say to women that you can touch yourself. You, mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with filling your breasts um, when you're, you know, at that time of the month. Yes. And now today I see people um, uh, taking that conversation that much farther. So we started the conversation, but people took it farther. I look at Janet Mbugwa, for instance, and I see what she's doing with the whole topic of menstruation. Yes. I mean, that's just amazing that we're yeah. able to bring that topic and to discuss it openly yeah. and publicly. So we started, uh, we did what we, we could, and I feel that, you know, a lot of um, other people have taken the baton and just, you know, taken it that much farther. Yeah. yeah. Do you think it's important to have uncomfortable conversations? Absolutely. Why? Um, because they're uncomfortable for a reason, because growth is never comfortable. And when you're, when you're going through something, you, you know, and if we don't uh, face our discomfort, then we don't help somebody else face their discomfort. So we've got to face our discomfort. And that's why it's important to have those conversations. It's important to have it also because our children are watching, our daughters are watching. And they're watching from a perspective of, oh my goodness, my mom never talked to me about menstruation. My mom never talked to me about my first you know, sexual experience and what I can expect and all of that. And my mom never talked to me about all these things that are uncomfortable, but if we have that conversation, we put it on the table, my daughter will know how I feel about it. She doesn't need to guess, you know. And another young woman out there who's, um, you know, part, you know, and the beauty about today is with a digital space is that those conversations, you can have them on your phone. Yeah. Back in the day, you'd be having, you couldn't have the conversation during the watershed hours yeah. on TV. Mm -hmm. But now you can literally just go onto your YouTube channel and have the conversation. And it's a private conversation, sure. you know, without too many other people yeah. watching. So there's, it's allowed those conversations to go much farther. Yeah. 
and to allow the people who need the help that they need to get the help and to realize there's nothing wrong with me if I've um, suffered whatever I've suffered, whether it's domestic violence or whatever it is, there's nothing wrong with me because somebody else has gone through it and she's talking about it and she's overcome. And she's and, okay. And she's okay. Yeah. Um, what happens when someone like you, who's gone through such a journey, especially when it comes to being a business owner, mm -hmm. faces challenges? Um, we're going through a worldwide pandemic. It's in its second year and it's been a challenging time so mm -hmm. you've been in the business a long time and mm -hmm. you've you faced um you know like when when we go through elections in kenya businesses go slow you've faced closure of um uh the magazine and where you decide okay i'm going to do this by myself what is your self-talk carol as a business owner who doesn't want to just say ah, okay, I'll just go look for employment and let this all go? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. And I must tell you, your interviewing skills are A1. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I have arrived. <laughs> I, I think okay, you're, that you're, you're doing, repeat. Yeah, you're doing a great job. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. That was a great question. Um, my self-talk, I think about, I look at the women in my life. I look at, the, I look at my, my mother. I look at my grandmother. And then I look at my daughters. And so for me, I start from a very, you know, and I ask myself, what is, um, what's my contribution? Um, why was I given the opportunities I was given if I'm gonna quit now? Uh, what would my grandmama say, um, you know, to me if she looks at me? First of all, she would be awed. She would be like, oh my goodness, my granddaughter, you have done so well. You, yeah. I went to, you know, I was dropped off school from class three, but look at you, you've done this, you've done that, you've done the other, my mother as well. And then I look at my daughters and I see the hope, hope in their eyes and um, the hope for themselves, for what their life can be because of what their mother was able to do herself. And so for me, that it's, it's not letting down the past and not letting down the future that drives me. Right. So I say to myself, okay, so what are these women going to say to me if I give up now? Does that mean there are no moments of giving up? I have lots of those moments, lots of them. I talk about it um, in the book that I've done. But, you know, just those, I call it the dark night of the soul those dark nights of the soul when you switch off the lights and you're lying in bed and the thoughts are going through your head. You're asking yourself, where am I going to pay salaries from? Where am I going to get money to do this? And how, how do we overcome this challenge? There are those, lots of those moments. And yeah, and I, and I feel tempted. I feel tempted to throw in the towel and go grow onions or something. <laughs> I'm like, hey, it's enough, done. Quit, I quit. <laughs> you guys do what you want to do. I'm out of here. Yeah. Carol's left the building. <laughs> but then I think about that. I think about, so my self-talk is really about um, why are you here? Because you're not just here for the good times. You're here for the challenges. You're here, and the reason why you're going through the challenges so that you can overcome it. And I always say, God, if God brought you to it, he will bring you through it. Yeah, yeah. So... That's what, that's, that's what drives me. And I want to add this quote by, um, I think it was Maya Angelou, and of course Oprah just made it go viral. <laughs> and she said that I, I, um, I, I stand, I, I come yeah. as one, but I stand as many, okay? I stand as many, that any, in any place where I stand, I don't stand by myself. Alone. I bring my grandmother, I bring my mother, and I bring my daughters. So I bring my past and I bring my future. And that's what helps me to stand and to feel secure in that moment, in all the discomfort of the moment, in all the challenges I may be facing at that moment, um, is just knowing that I'm not alone at that place. And I must do my bit so that my daughters can do their bit. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is so powerful. You've uh, made reference to the book, which I'm going to come to just now, but I love what you've just said, that I've, I've, I stand alone, but mm. I, I come with many. And, you know, there is a lot of talk about 
ancestors and ancestral healing. I don't mm. know if you believe in this. I don't know if you've read up on it, on it mm. but they say if you heal yourself, mm -hmm. you actually are doing generations of healing. Do you believe mm. in that? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's true because there's pain. You see, like what our ancestors give us, they give us their pain. They bequeath us their pain. Yes. So a lot of your pain, my pain, is also because of pain my mother went through. So if my mother was, you know, let's assume, for instance, a victim of domestic violence, um, the way she raised me was colored by that. Yes. And so part of my wounding is her wounding. Yeah. So um, when I get to a place of self-awareness and recognizing, I have to ask myself, how much of what I'm doing or how I'm responding to this situation is me and how much of it is ancestral? How much of it am I carrying? The sins of our fathers and the sins of our mothers. And then when I recognize what's mine and what's theirs, then I have to heal me and I have to heal them. what they did to me. So I have to go back uh. and almost apologize um, to my mom or s have a conversation with my mom who's no longer there, but say, mom, I understand, I get it, I get it. You tried to love me, but you couldn't love me beyond your own pain. Yeah. And, um, and I forgive you for whatever you gave me, whether it's a view of life that um, has hampered me, I forgive you and I release you from it. I'll not longer hold you to it. And so in doing that, then I free her. She's not here physically, but I free her and I free myself. So I completely, totally believe in that. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. But how many of us are aware of it and how do we reach this point of awareness that what we are doing is hampered by what, you know, the filter that our, our ancestors may have passed down or bequeathed us, as yes. you said. How many of us are aware of it? How do we become aware of it, Carol? Wow, but uh, great question. <laughs> Pinky Galani. <laughs> um, how do we become aware of it? I think if I talk about my personal journey, I became aware of it basically because looking at the triggers. So say, for instance, your daughter does something and you come down on her like a ton of bricks, you know, and you, I would ask myself, why am I so triggered? Why did that trigger me so much? Or looking at the pain points in your life, why does that hurt so much? Why does it hurt so much if people don't support me at the workplace? Why do I feel like the whole world has abandoned me? Yeah. Is it because maybe somebody abandoned me in the past? Is it because I felt a sense of rejection in the past? Um, is it because I felt a sense of shame in the past, a sense of guilt in the past? Then when I look at that, I ask myself, at what point in my life did I have those feelings? And when you go back there, you'll see a three-year-old, you'll see a five-year-old, and you'll be like, oh my goodness, that day I needed my mom to be there for me. And she walked out and she left me. I felt a sense of abandonment. Do you get what I mean? So, I do. so when you look at that and you begin to use a, a Swahili word, chambua, to pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. And your mom left you, not because maybe she was going to work, mm. but you were three years old, you just felt abandoned. And you carried that sense of ab abandonment so that when you're in a relationship, it shows up. But it's not because this person is abandoning you. It's because of a past wound. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. So you punish this person for your mother abandoning you at three, you abandoning yourself consistently, and the person is like, okay, I just <laughs> needed to go away <laughs> to distress, <laughs> you know? And, um, and then I think it comes from a place of self-awareness. So for me, my journey has been, ask yourself those questions. Ask yourself why. Why, why am I feeling this? Why does this hurt so much? Why can't I let go? Why can't I get over? Uh, why does this trigger me? And then look at your past. Because when you heal your past, then you're able, you, you just become like a new person. Mm -hmm. Literally, just going forward, you become a new person. But ask yourself those questions. We say in Swahili, jitem kutana, call yourself to a meeting. And not very regularly, very regularly just do that. That's fascinating. I, I'm, I'm so intrigued because it sounds like, it sounds like you have um, had years of therapy. 
<laughs> I wish I couldn't afford years of therapy, trust me. No, because it's, you know, to be able to reach this, this level where you're able to understand how to heal yourself, you need some, sometimes you need professional help. Mm -hmm. But um, it sounds so personal, like you've discovered this by yourself and you are purposeful on how to use it to better yourself. And that's all we need to do, right? That's all we need to do. I pray a lot. Pinky, I pray a lot. And for me, it's more of a spiritual journey. And it's in asking those questions that I find my answers. Um, because God wants you to heal. That's the reality. God wants you to heal. So when you begin to ask the questions, the answers show themselves up in your environment. Um, and you made an, you know, you alluded to therapy. I did a little bit of therapy, maybe just a couple of months, yeah. and it helped me immensely. Yeah. Um, but there's also a lot of help out there. There's a lot of help online. Yes. Um, there's a lot of help in just getting together with women yeah. who are progressively minded. It's very important that they're growth minded, and it's not just about being with women or being with men. It's about the quality of that um, association are these people going to help you to see yourself to see what you need to see because sometimes we we have a blind spot and we can't see it and your friends can either create another blind spot for you or they can help you see it and they can tell you pinky you know really you need to stop doing this mm -hmm. you get what i'm saying but only people who really love you from a genuine place and who are who are invested in your personal growth and development will be able to point that out whether it's business or it's in personal relationships. And, you know, but they will be placed in your path because God wants you to heal. So the moment you begin asking those questions and the moment you begin praying, look out, the answers are there. The answers will show up. So many of the ladies who come on the show talk about prayer and how important it is. But you've talked about something very important as well, as, especially as women, you know, knowing your tribe, really valuing your circle. Um, should you take offense if your friends call you out? Well, no. I mean, obviously you will. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to lie and say that it's nice to be told something about yourself that you had either been blind to or you had been ignoring. All right? Um, and it will hurt. Criticism tends to hurt. Um, so when they call you out, but the, I think the thing to ask yourself is, where is this person coming from? And is what they're saying true? Okay. Yeah. Um, and because sometimes people will criticize you from their own pain. So you need to be so clear. That's also true. That, you know, whatever you're saying, I don't take it. Yeah. I don't accept it. You know, don't let people just speak into your life. Yeah. Whatever you're saying, I don't accept it. Um, it's not me. It's not my future. It's not my present. Um, but if there's truth in it, um, and if you're really honest with yourself and there's truth in it, and this person is coming from a place of love, then you do yourself a disservice not to, to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. And then how do you know that your circle is real or true? Or is that trial and error? Trial is and error. Is that going through heartbreak? Yes. And then sometimes your circle, it's very interesting because sometimes your circle um, are with you or they're great for a certain mm -hmm. season. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you go into another season. Now you've started doing yes. uh, Pinky TV. You're yeah. in another season, and your circle doesn't want you to be in this season, yeah. and your circle doesn't. So the whole thing about assuming that sometimes certain relationships will stay static for the for the entire for entire lives isn't true. What is true is that if you've had a really good friend, and this person has supported you, or you've supported her through let's say a crisis but in this new phase of your life she's not supporting you or you're not supporting her maybe it's because she's got she's got a different um, focus different interest or whatever or maybe she's just feeling like i am so unhappy that things are working out for pinky and they're not working out for me yeah and she's not able to rise above her own um issues issues yeah and so she's not able to provide you with the support you've got to allow her and because your support for that season or for that moment will come from someone else. And sometimes for me, it's so interesting because it comes from the most unlikely places. Do you get what I'm saying? Because I'm like, oh, this person's my friend. They've always been my friend. They're supposed to be there for me. And then you go through something and they're not for whatever reason. Mm. Do you get what I'm saying? But I, want, I don't want to carry them. You've got to travel. 
my new mantra, travel light. So you've got to travel oh, I light. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> so I don't want to carry the fact that we've been friends for 20 years, and this time when I needed you and my business was going through challenges, yeah. you were not there, and now it's, it's, our relationship is over. Our relationship is changing. Our relationship is evolving. And for this season, it wasn't you. I've got to release you from, from that and just say, you know what? It's been good. Um, our relationship will be what it will be in the future, but I no longer expect you to stand with me at this point because somebody else, you have to create room for the next person to come and stand with me at this particular point. Um, and sometimes when people sta don't stand with you, they miss out, they lose something. Yeah. Um, but it's not, it's, not, it's not on you, it's on them. Yeah, because me they also have to heal themselves. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's not your cross to carry. No. So it's, it's um, um, you're going to know why I'm saying this, but it's like you're continuously pivoting. And that's my segue <laughs> <laughs> into this, pivoting in heels. I want you to talk to me about this. So a lot of people who come here have had COVID babies, we call them COVID mm. babies, which mm. are books. But this is very, very unique. Yeah. And I don't think this is because of COVID. I think this is just who you are. You're always able to innovate and create new things. You're always able to stay on brand on who Carol Mandy is, which is a woman who is going to inspire and empower other women. That's what I believe Thank you, you are. Thank you. So please talk to me about this because when I got this, it was amazing. I was like, ah, ah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Pinky. So this book was born out of um, 2020 and just how it was such a difficult year for me okay. in business. Yeah. And, um, and there were moments in 2020, I thought to myself, I'm going to close my business. I'm going to shut my business down because it wasn't making sense. We weren't bringing in the revenues that we were expecting to bring in. And, um, and to have worked on this business for 11 years and to see one year yeah. just come sort of like obliterate a lot of the stuff that we had done. We had all these exciting plans and we were like, oh, we're going to do more events. We're going to do this. And, um, and then 2020 happens. And I wasn't, it wasn't only happening to me. It was happening to a lot of media houses. A lot of media houses used so retrenched stuff. Yeah gave pay cuts. I mean, so there was just a lot of things going on, not just in media, but also in business and enterprise in general. And, um, but in so doing, again, sit, sitting in the dark night of the soul and asking yourself, okay, so why am I here? Why am I going through this? How do I get myself out of this? How do I survive so that my daughters can thrive? Um, I had to begin to do a lot of things. And so Pivoting in Heels was born out of the conversations I had with a lot of women who had gotten to the dark, that dark place yeah. and said to themselves, okay, how do I carry my stuff with me? Yeah. Um, we have to lay off people. We have to retrench. We have to uh, reduce um, salaries. How are we going to do this? How are we going to keep people safe? How are we going to keep them alive? How are we going to make sure that our teams will still deliver with motivation when they're not able to see one another because they're working from home? How are we going to be able to deal with, as, as an employee, for instance, um, I'm now uh, not just working for my organization. I'm homeschooling my children. I'm a teacher. I've probably um, asked my domestic staff to go home because of mm. safety issues. Yeah. So I'm also running the household. Um, there were lots of burdens on women, um, you know, in 2020. So not just from a professional perspective, we saw domestic violence go rise. Yeah. So there were all these things. And how were these women still able to keep their organizations running, keep their families together, um, keep their businesses going? How are they able to do that? And how are they able not to be taken by the tsunami of 2020 and become another casualty. Um, in having those conversations, women kept saying to me, I have to tell you my story. I have to tell you what I did. I have, they wanted to talk, they wanted to vent, as most women do. So that's when I just felt, let's get all of that, you know, all of those stories, put it together in a book so that it can become inspirational for other people to understand that when you go through challenges, um, that you know, courage can rise, um, that resilience will rise, that innovation uh, becomes important, that empathy 
uh, and human connectivity, you know, even if it's remotely, is important and how to keep all of those things going. That it's about our humanness and not just about the bottom line. That the bottom line is important. How, what, how else do we make money? Ask yourself those questions. And so all the women in the book went through those moments and you know, they managed to pivot in hills. Yes. Now you know pivoting is hard enough, right? It's hard, yeah. But pivoting in, in hills, hills is harder because then you've got to do it with grace. You've got to do it with agility. It's being able to turn around things, but with grace, with agility, with your feminine uh, power, yes. as it were, yeah. And it's amazing because you've got like people like Nancy Matimu, you've got Phyllis Wakiaga, who's also been on the show, Priscilla Muhiu. That's why I was saying every page is amazing. And again, that's because you're Carol Mandy, you're able to pick up the phone and get these people just available for you. How does that make you feel? <laughs> um, interesting. It was very interesting. I was very grateful yeah. that um, I don't, I think every woman I called, um, said, yes, I'll do it. Yeah. And many of them, I didn't know who they were. I mean, I'd never met them personally. Yes, yes, yeah. um, but it was just very interesting. But it just speaks to the fact that I have done what I've done for the last 20 years. Yes. Um, so people know who I am, and they trust who I am. And they said, okay, so if she wants to do a book, then I definitely want to be in it. So I think it just speaks to that. It speaks to the longevity of, yeah. of, uh, of my career yeah. and uh, the faithfulness of God. But it was, there's only one person I wanted in the book, in this particular, this is volume one, yeah. who couldn't make it because she's out of the country, uh, Dorothy Getuba, who's heading oh, Netflix yes. yeah. for Africa. Uh, but we'll get her in for volume two. Okay. So, so yeah, but every single person came through and I was just really grateful for that. That's amazing. And it's not only a Kenyan product now. No. Tell us no, about so, that. Oh, this is very exciting. Yeah. Um, the book has morphed, yeah. you know, so I'm off to Lagos in another two weeks um, because we're doing Pivoting in Hills Lagos. Again, we're going to talk to CEOs, entrepreneurs in, in Africa's biggest economy wow. and how they managed to also pivot in Hills. Yeah. And then we're also going to be in South Africa. So it's now a continental project. Um, so it's very exciting. And we're going to do events in both those regions. Yeah. And um, we're also looking at franchising it out to whoever wants to do it in any of the other countries yes. in, in Africa, being able to just bring alive the stories of women and how women manage to pivot, how they manage to survive, how they manage to thrive in 2020, 2021 and, and yeah, beyond. beyond. And beyond. Yes. So what does it take uh, to be a successful African woman? Oh, wow, that's a difficult one. <laughs> That's not, a it's not difficult. a great question. <laughs> well, it's a great question. Yeah. It's a difficult one. I know it's um, not just one thing. It's not one thing. Yeah. It's not one Maybe thing. Maybe you can give us five things. Whoa. Okay. I think be true to who you are. Understand what your purpose is, what your gifts are, what your contribution to the society is going to be. Because for me, success is money in the bank, yes, but success is impact. Success is contribution. And a lot of people make a contribution to their society and their bank balance may not reflect the contribution that they've made. So, but does that person go to bed and, and feel I've done good, I've done good by my ancestors or by my future generations? The answer is probably yes. So de define success for yourself. Um, understand your purpose, understand the gifts that you come bearing and how to then leverage those gifts or give them to the betterment of your community or, you know, uh, or your family. Um, so I think that's what it means to be a successful African woman. And also I feel um, an African woman needs to, um, I think Africans are very communal. Um, don't run away from who you are. Don't run away from your roots. Don't try and do it the way Kamala Harris is doing it. Mm. Do it as an African woman. Show up as an African woman. Show up um, because you've been placed here for, I like to say, such a time as this. You know, So you have to play your part, but be an African woman um, and understand that we don't just think of ourselves. We think about our community. Um, and we bring our community, our mothers, our fathers, our entire community, and we bring it forward. Um, so that's what I think, in many words, 
Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you, Pinky. I can't believe the time's just gone like that. Just like that. It was yeah. so amazing talking with you. It's amazing you are a as great always. interviewer. Ah, I, I Man, appreciate take this, that. I've take learned this from far. the best. Take I've this far. from the best. <laughs> Carol and I would love to hear from you. Let us know what you think about what Carol said about ancestral healing, about speaking to your daughters and your children about, you know, all the things that you and I maybe couldn't talk to our mothers about, and also about what makes a successful African woman. Thank you so, so much, Carol. Just before you go, where can we get the book? Um, uh, go onto the True Love Instagram page or Facebook page. The details will be there, um, and we will deliver within Nairobi. Awesome. And yeah. it's how much? It's 2,500 shillings. I think every woman needs to own a copy. I, in fact, no, every person. Because it's a true celebration of Kenyan women. And I look forward to volume two. Yay! Yes. <laughs> Where we will have you in volume two. I better two. be there. Yes. I better be there. <laughs> you heard it here on camera, okay? I have her on record. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for watching. Um, make sure, like I said before, you comment and go out and buy this book. On the show, we encourage you, as always, I leave you with this reminder. Remember to be brave enough to learn to unlearn. See you again. Bye.